So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ricardo Melendez Ortiz. I'm the head of uh, the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development, ICTSD. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this uh, today conference. Um, it is an undertaking of ICTSD in cooperation with the World Trade Institute, the WTI. Uh, I'll uh, turn the floor to Pierre uh, Sauvé in a moment, uh, who's been responsible to a great extent for the content and the design of this conference. But just before that, let me just uh, try to uh, give you a little context of uh, uh, why we're doing this at this time. And, um, and start by telling you that we have just spent um, a day and a half with uh, experts from around the world looking at uh, the question of uh, uh, services in international trade and uh, how to come up with some ideas of how to strengthen the global trade system uh, with respect to services. Services are, as you all know now, the fastest growing component of world trade measured in gross terms or only as final products crossing borders, services represent around one-fifth of world trade. But we have all known for some time that services are more important than traditional statistics have shown us. Services are an essential part of our daily lives, both as consumers, as producers, and as operated operators in international markets. A recent report produced by the Swedish National Board of Trade for this A15 group of services experts, where the National Board of Trade is a knowledge partner, has underlined the steady shift into ever more service intensive economies and has called this serviceification. Others have called it servication. As my colleague Sherry Stephenson says, the services area is now stretching our vocabulary, even as it has stretched and challenged our ima imagination in past years. New services have changed the way of life for consumers, brought about new opportunities for integration into markets, and significantly altered the patterns of output and trade for producers. Services are now integral components of virtually all that is produced and traded, services serve as inputs into the final output of manufacturers, agricultural products, and primary products. They have enabled a huge increase of trade in intermediate products, now 70% of all trade flaws, which has turned the thinking about trade and the effectiveness of traditional trade policy instruments upside down. Services are invisible in a way that is different from how we thought of these three decades ago. Now they are invisible not because we cannot see or feel them, but because they are embedded into other products and services and usually not recorded on their own merit. Only recently, with the OECD WTO trading value added database, the so-called TIVA database, and other value added databases, have we been able to appreciate the real significance uh, of services. We now know that services represent nearly half of world trade on a value added basis. Services are incorporated into traded goods, ranging from a wide range of high-tech, branded and designed rich products, to clothing, resource intensive products, and traditional food products. Services also take nearly two-thirds of all new FDI flows and generate the greatest employment and productivity increases in our economies by constituting the areas of greatest innovation. Services have been at the, heart, at the heart of the changes we have witnessed not only in our lives, but also in world trade, particularly over the past two decades. With trade patterns increasingly defined now by production fragmented in value adding stages in a chain configuration across borders and covered in multiple jurisdictions before being delivered as final goods into one or often many markets. Services are the glue in these value chains, allowing for producers in locations around the globe to be bound together in a network of productive interactions. Lower transport and telecommunication costs and IT products allow all consumers as well as producers to be connected across the globe in fractions of the time that it used to take. Services have opened up tremendous avenues of development for developing countries as well as potential new areas and ways in which to engage in international trade. Cross-border trading services 
allows even the smallest firms or individuals to internationalize and act as a multinational and sell across borders by specializing in a services task, either as a final product or often as a part of a global value chain. However, all of this has meant significant challenges for the World Trade System. As WTO Director General Roberto Cevedo said in his remarks to the opening of the WTO Public Forum in 2013, the fast pace of innovation driven by services is at odds with the outdated trade disciplines that still govern us. Current WTO rules were conceived in a world with no internet, <coughs> sorry, with no internet connections as we know it today. World trade frameworks for ser services that were fashioned more than 20 years ago during the Euro wave are showing their age in our fast moving services and globalized economy. The engagements on market access as well as the flanking disciplines under the GATS have not been touched since 1993. Research has shown that there is a big and growing gap between existing levels of market openness in services trade and investment and the bank commitments under the GATS that were taken out during the Uruguay round. However, we may also think of the present situation as a gap in governance in as much as the GATS rules do not address many of the new issues that the changes in technology, markets, and policy of the past two decades have brought to the forefront. This gap in governance can prove as challenging to members of the multilateral trading system as the gap in market access. The trading system and other trade frameworks are in urgent need for update to retain the relevance in order to best innovation and sustainable development patterns. WTO members face the common challenge of having to respond to way in which, ways in which developmental objectives are being pursued and the innovative ways in which business are being conducted around the globe now. This conference is therefore, therefore a welcome step in the direction of more discussion and understanding of some of the key new issues confronting services trade today, as well as the challenges they pose for governance. Some of these issues are being negotiated in certain ongoing trade initiatives but for many countries, the opportunity to learn about this and about the issues concerned has not been forthcoming. In the context of the E15 initiative of ICTSD and the World Economic Forum, as well as through ICTSD's work on services, we have been gathering thinking to help countries update the governance frameworks and thus meet these challenges. The task is a daunting one, no doubt about it, but there are ways forward and some of them may do with, for instance, finding a modality to allow countries interested in improving the global trade environment in services to engage within the WTO, perhaps in the context of the value mandated work program, in a process aimed at the institutionalization of regulatory cooperation. In the 21st, in 21st services trade, regulations enable or impaired a country's economy a service provider or a services consumer from taking full advantage of opportunities provided by developments in technology and markets. Regulatory cooperation could at its minimum allow countries and services markets to have a transparent view of measures in place. Such an exercise could result in an innovative soft law platform that with wide base ownership helps catapult the benefits of trading services. In the case of SMEs, which is a big political concern to many countries participating in the WTO. Institutionalized regulatory cooperation is for obvious reasons where impact could be more profoundly generated. But there are more uh, innovative ways in which we can deal with the current uh, uh, patterns of the global economy. For instance, looking forward, uh, some of the discussions yesterday that we're having uh, to my mind, some questions like uh, whether we can uh, really make a difference between the treatment of essentially tangible services versus embedded services, those that are inherent to the goods that are, that are traded. Could the market access approaches and rules on goods now uh, integrated so that coiffured or hairdressing services are different to clothes transformation into a suit through design and tailoring services, for instance. Through the TIVA exercises and the learning of the past few years, we now know uh, with more detail about the value content of the goods, the services, and the goods and services that are associated to each other.
So, again, going with some, throwing out some suggestions into the future, we could probably associate certain services to specific tariff lines or categories in an integrated NAMA services market access negotiation. That may be something to think about um, into the future. <coughs> the question of associateness of services works in both directions. Services today require physical goods to be delivered, and physical goods required services to operate. That's something that was obvious to us, for instance, uh, a, a few days ago, as we organized a workshop on, environmental good, on the environmental goods agreement negotiation and look at the possibility of uh, dealing with services in those negotiations. Knowing what we know today, should we go about moving forward in the same ways that we have done in the past? Or should we recognize, really, the differences of the current world to come up with innovative uh, ways of dealing with the governance of trade in services and goods? So there's, these are just a few examples, but we'll certainly hear more from the experts um, today and tomorrow. This is an incredibly rich uh, conference in the way that it has been designed with absolutely uh, top of the uh, state of the art presentations from top experts. ICTSD is pleased to host this timely conference together with the World Trade Institute. As I said before, credit for the organization of the conference goes really to my colleague Sherry, Sherry Stephenson as well as to Pierre Sauvé. So I welcome you again and turn the floor now to Pierre. Pierre. That function, sorry, um, you just missed. Me. It was an amazing job, <laughs> but I'm not going to repeat it. I'll try to think of another one. Um, I was with Ricardo, and through Ricardo, of course, Sherry and Cecile and the whole team, uh, a quite remarkable supply chain uh, to use uh, a term that is a la modi. Um, <coughs> Organizing these conferences is a lot of work, um, and so we're extremely, extremely grateful for the assistance we've received. This, this conference is a bit of an appetizer. It's an appetizer for a book that is forthcoming, uh, not all of whose papers will be presented, uh, a sampling of the papers. Um, and it's a book that Martin Roy um, from the WTO Secretariat and myself are co-editing, published by Edward Elger. I should have thought, I should have thanked Edward Elger first um, for approaching me about 14 months ago and saying, would you like to do a research handbook on trade and services? And my first reaction, of course, at my advanced stage, no, I'm not interested in more work. I'm counting the days retirement. Please leave me alone. And then I said, well, maybe, maybe there's room for that kind of a book. Um, I was very lucky 15 years ago um, to be on paid leave, paid leave from the OECD uh, at Harvard University. Can you imagine being paid by the OECD to go to Harvard? And um, of course, I felt very guilty about that, so I, I produced quite a lot. And I produced one book um, with Robert Stern from the University of Michigan. Uh, which was called GATS 2000, New Directions in Services Trade Liberalization. Uh, it's out of stock. Uh, it was published by Brookings. My mother bought all copies. <laughs> wanted to make sure I got the royalties, you know, to pay back uh, her investment in the book. But it was a book that really, I think, in all humility, um, was very helpful in charting a course. We had some amazing contributors. Uh, many of which are in this room today, uh, trying to think ahead uh, in services trade. And in a way, 15 years later, we're confronted with a very similar challenge of thinking through uh, where we've been, what lessons we draw from the first quarter century of services discussions. We've been having conversations on trade and services really in a very orchestrated manner in a trade setting for little more than 25 years. It's not a lot of time. And of course, 
when we've not been discussing anything for long, when we haven't been practicing things for long, um, we are still typically in learning by doing mode. So the spirit of this book was to try to identify a number of issues rooted in past practice, in the path we've been on, but also to try to anticipate where we're going and to create some ideas that, you know, in the spirit of academic research, uh, could find ways of being filtered into the policy uh, very much the spirit. We couldn't, unfortunately, for lack of funding, bring everyone, and it would have made uh, it would have made for a conference of about nine days if we had everyone, because there are many chapters in this book. So we're just giving you a bit of a, an apéro, an appetizer, uh, over the next uh, day and a half. Um, the um, I, I think uh, I'm not going to go into any of the substantive elements because Ricardo, uh, in his very nice introduction, I gave gave us a lot of food for thought uh, already. But the spirit is that of brainstorming. You will have in front of you uh, a very group of old farts and new talent. Uh, and it's a nice combination, you know, because there's also an element of generational transmission uh, in uh, the design of this book. We wanted to actually have a mix of old and new uh, and maybe because of a sense that, you know, at least one of the co-editors is soon going to retire. Martin still has a few more years to go. But I'm closer to him, to, to that day in Nirvana. And I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, keen to see uh, the succession uh, taking place and nurturing uh, young talent. Um, and it's, and it's, uh, it's really exciting to see that. Many of, the, that. many of those talented young people were actually... Uh, my students. So it's really, from an academic perspective, extremely heartening uh, to be able to witness uh, that uh, transmission from one generation to another. I think I've said enough. Um, the context is one of brainstorming. We want to really uh, maximize interaction with an audience that is also very expert. There's a lot of knowledge about this topic in this room. Um, so I'm going to ask the chairs of our different sessions to be brutal uh, in their time management um, and uh, to the presenters to, of course, exercise uh, judicial economy uh, in the use and choice of words. Um, and I would like, of course, to thank uh, them, uh, both the contributors to the book and those who have kindly agreed, in some cases on very short notice, uh, to serve as discussants uh, for uh, enriching uh, our discussions over the next day. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Ricardo. And um, the floor is, is yours, Valerie. Just before Valerie takes the floor, I think it, it's due oh, yes. to... We forgot to, something important. Yeah, <laughs> to thank uh, uh, both the ambassadors and um, the missions of Colombia and uh, Mexico to the WTO for facilitating that we organize this meeting here. So thank you. Are they in the room? Yes. Thank you very much, Pierre. Thank you, Ricardo, for uh, introducing uh, this event, and thank you for asking me to serve as chair here. Well, I, actually, I'm not sure if I should be thanking you because I know that I'm not one of the new talents, so that must be, <laughs> that must mean, let's see. Anyway, um, I'll try and keep awake long enough to manage uh, the, the, the panel. At, at my advanced age, we're not so sure. <clears throat> but we do have a really good panel, so I think I will be able to stay awake. We're going to talk about the law of services trade insights from case law and future directions in rulemaking. We have three themes that we're going to do. You'll see in your agenda in front of you, we're going to start with lessons from appellate body and panel decisions based on GATS and implications for development. Next, we're going to look at standardization and services, new frontiers in rulemaking, and then we're going to look at why the GATS needs its own TBT agreement. Uh, we'll have discussants uh, after that. So I'll introduce all of our speakers at once so that we can go from one to the other. Um, 
Our first uh, speaker, lessons from appellate body and panel decisions and implications for development, Peter van den Bosche, will be speaking to us on that first theme. And as everyone in the room knows very well, indeed, Peter is a member of the appellate body. He was appointed in December 2009 for his first term, and in December 2013 was appointed for a second term on the appellate body. Peter, of course, is also a professor, professor of international economic law at Maastricht University, uh, professor also at College of Europe in Bruges, and also uh, serves on the faculty of WTI, as well as other faculties. He's uh, got a frequent flyer card, I'm sure, because he teaches in uh, China, in uh, Spain, in uh, Tanzania, uh, in Turkey, and uh, I know there are other places as well. And so I think, uh, Peter, uh, we're lucky to have him uh, in Geneva now and again, and he's going to uh, speak uh, on the first uh, theme. Uh, but before I introduce Peter, let me introduce our other speakers. Next, standardization in services will be presented by Professor Delematsis. And as those of you uh, who know him, he's Associate Professor of Law at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. And full professor, professor you have to update your um, CV that uh, we printed. Um, I always said he should be full professor. I didn't know why. And uh, Senior Research Fellow, or is it extra fellow at the WTI. Former, former. Former. I shouldn't pay attention to this at all. Yeah. And so anyway, he's a really smart guy, and he's going to talk about standardization and services. Then um, we are going to have two papers. Uh, Petros Mephroidis and Bernard Hochman have done papers for us, but the person who's going to present them is my colleague Peter Morrison, who's a counselor in the services division uh, here at the WTO, and he um, previously served as counselor in the appellate body secretariat, and he was also uh, with the legal affairs division during GATT days. He joined the GATT in 1989, and Peter also served in Clifford Chance as head of the World Trade Group in that law firm from 1996 to 1999. As discussant, we have uh, Fabien Gell, who is with the um, EU delegation here in Geneva, has been since September, and uh, he is responsible for trade and services issues, and Fabien has been de dealing with trade and services for 10 years now. Unfortunately, uh, Werner Stotz, who is on the program, uh, had uh, an emergency uh, meeting and is unable to join us. So that means that we'll actually be finished on time. No, don't tell him I said that part, but it, 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 uh, it does mean that we will have more time, I think, for your questions. So each of our speakers is going to go for about 20 minutes. And then at the end, uh, we will be able to turn to you for your questions and answers to contribute to this, uh, to this event. So. Uh, with that, let me turn to Peter van den Bosche, please. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, the invitation did come with a warning. Uh, 20 minutes, no more. Um, and um, since we're is presided by Valerie, um, I know that 20 minutes Maybe 25 minutes, but definitely not more. Um, that seems like quite a challenge, 20 minutes uh, to talk about Gantz jurisprudence to date. Um, but it isn't, um, because there hasn't been that much jurisprudence. Um, and that in itself is perhaps quite shocking. Um, given the uh, things that have been said already in this introduction, the importance of services and trading services to the global economy. Uh, and I'll have some data on that uh, in a minute. Uh, now, the organizers, the title is mine. The organizers gave me the subtitle. And the subtitle, so I don't claim any responsibility for the subtitle. But le let us look at the subtitles. Lessons um, from appellate body and panel decisions based on the GATS. I'm not sure whether there are many lessons, um, and if there are lessons, uh, they're definitely not very spectacular, uh, not very uh, groundbreaking. Second part of the subtitle, Implications for Development, um, that is uh, eyes far too thin uh, for an appellate body member to thread on. Um, so I will not comment on uh, the latter, although I see the disappointment in the eyes of Pierre 
But Pierre, you, you knew this. I was not going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> he always tries. Uh, needless to say that I will be talking in my academic capacity and not that uh, of an appellate body member. Let's start. Um, just to start with an overview, I will talk first um, very briefly uh, about the disputes uh, in which gas issues um, were raised years. I'll give you some data, give you some background, and then uh, we will look at what we have learned, the lessons uh, from these um, the disputes. And um, I will look at uh, the scope of application of the GATS, the most favored nation treatment obligation, uh, the national treatment obligation, market access obligation, interpretation of schedules of commitments, and general exceptions, and all that in 25 minutes. Um, <laughs> thank you, Pierre. Um, I will try to make it as exciting as possible, but um, you will notice that there are limits to that. Uh, this is, after all, law. And I noticed that they put all the lawyers in the beginning of the program, and then tomorrow they get into the interesting things. Um, anyway, um, look at some data. Gets disputes. 1995-2014, numbers, as I already said, not that many, and actually that's probably the understatement of the day. Um, if we look at requests for consultations, uh, you know that um, as of last Friday, when I last checked it, there had been 486 requests for consultations overall. Only 23, that's less than 5%, um, deal with GATS issues, raise GATS issues, often not independently from other claims, but at less than 5% of these requests for consultations raise GATS issues. Panel reports, there have been so far 197 panel reports, um, only 12 of them deal with GATS issues, and even that number is misleading because in those 12 you've got four banana reports. <laughs> Appellate body reports, um, we have had so far 113 appellate body reports, five deal with um, GATS issues, and that number actually includes um, Canada periodicals, which would normally not appear on most people's list of uh, a GATS uh, case, but the appellate body did say something about GATS, so I can put it in my list. That's five. That's less than five percent. Now, if you look at pending cases, um, there are currently 20 uh, disputes at the consultation stage. One out of those 20 deals with uh, GATS. That is uh, DS-476 for the amateurs. Uh, that is EU um, energy sector, a case brought by um, Russia. And um, of the 25 disputes that are currently at the panel level, there's only one that deals with gas issues. And that is um, Argentina trade in goods and services, a case brought by Panama, Panama complainant, uh, and there the report is expected um, in mid-2015, so for, for another panel report on services, uh, in 2015, mid-2015, you'll have that uh, report. Um, unless, of course, Valerie tells me differently, because she sits on the most accurate. <laughs> now, um, and in terms of what the appellate body has currently three cases before it, none deals with uh, GATS. Key disputes, and, and, and now I'm already narrowing it down to, 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 to key disputes um, in which there were panel or appellate body reports, um, and this will, I think, all be familiar to you, EC Bananas, and between brackets, I note the date of adoption of sort of the first report. There have been a number of EC Banana reports, but the one, the first one, when it was adopted, when that body report in that case was adopted, that was 19, 
Um, Canada Autos, Mexico Telecoms, US Gambling, China Publications and Audiovisual Products, and China Electronic Payment Services. And ladies and gentlemen, that's basically it. Uh, the star indicates the cases in which uh, there was also an appellate body report. Now, a few cases means that of that, out of that universe, that enormous universe of possible services, only few services have to date uh, been subject uh, to um, have been subject of um, uh, disputes. And I've listed them here uh, for you. Um, services at issue have been um, wholesale trade services, uh, both in bananas and in cars. Telecommunication services, gambling and betting services, that's probably the most surprising one in that list. It's probably also the most exciting one. Um, distribution services and banking services. Now, the measures at issue uh, were challenged uh, for their WTO consistency, their WTO gas consistency. Uh, include in all these cases um, quite a wide variety of measures. Huh? You go from import license uh, in EC bananas to import duty exemptions in Canada autos to interconnection rates in Mexico telecoms to the total prohibition on cross border supply in US gambling to the prohibition of and limitations on distribution and limitations on commercial presence in China, publications and audiovisual products, and in, on the requirements relating to electronic payment services in, not surprising, China electronic payment services. That's the universe of GATS cases, not more. Now, what have we learned from those cases? First of all, we've learned something in terms of the scope of application of the GATS. Uh, as we all know, Article 1.1 of the GATS uh, says the GATS applies to measures by members affecting trading services. And in EC Bananas, uh, the appellate body said that affecting means having an effect on and he then went on saying, well, uh, that means that the scope of application of the GATS is actually pretty broad. And he used a number of other arguments to, to illustrate that the scope of application of GATS discipline is broad, very broad. Um, and then in another case, Canada Autos, we learned something else about uh, measures covered by GATS. And that something else is that, that you that the first question that if you have a GATS dispute, or you think you have a GATS dispute, the first question that you have to ask is whether the measure at issue is a measure that falls within the scope of the GATS. And you need to answer that threshold question before you can get into the question of whether that measure is consistent or inconsistent with the GATS obligations. That's something that needed to be said by the appellate body because the panel had a different view on this. Now, on the scope of application, one more thing, and that relates to the relationship between the GATS and the GAT. Um, and um, something had already been said about that in Canada periodicals, um, but it came really to the fore in EC Bananas. And what to many people's surprise, perhaps, is that um, the scope of application of the GATS and the GAT may overlap. You can have a measure that falls both under the disciplines of the GAT and the GATS. It, it, it may seem now an obvious thing to us, but back then it confused many people. Most favorite nation treatment obligation. Um, what has the case law told us so far? Well, first of all, 
uh, with regard to uh, de facto discrimination. The appellate body in EC Bananas said that, well, Article 2, which is the, uh, the relevant article in this context, while Article 2, unlike Article 17, which deals with uh, national treatment, while Article 2 does not explicitly say that de facto discrimination is covered by the most favored nation treatment obligation, Article 2, the most favored nation treatment obligation, does cover de facto discrimination. Some of the reasoning was, well, they've said it explicitly that it covered de facto discrimination in Article 17. The fact that it doesn't say anything in Article 2 could perhaps be interpreted as meaning that Article 2, Most Favored Nation Treatment Obligation, does not cover uh, de facto discrimination. The appellate body said, no, 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 no. No, uh, actually, the uh, obligation in Article 2 is unqualified. It doesn't say that it does not cover de facto discrimination, and just think about this, how easy it would become for smart government legislators to circumvent the most favored nation treatment obligation if it did not cover de facto discrimination. So the appellate body read de facto discrimination into Article um, uh, 2 of the uh, GATS, and I've never really read any criticism of that. Um, Second point, the relevance of aims and effects of a measure. Um, there are undoubtedly, like in every audience, there are still enthusiasts of aims and effects, and they're always awesome in any audience. Um, but uh, with regard to the relevance of aims and effects in deciding whether there's a violation of the most favored nation treatment obligation, uh, the appellate body said in EC Bananas um, that aims and effects are of no relevance. Um, we're talking about the non-discrimination obligation, so uh, it, it's quite normal that we are worried about huh, likeness, um, and in this context, like services, service suppliers. In the context of Article 2, most favorite nation, there's very little case law on this. Um, we've got a bit more uh, in the context of Article 17, national treatment, I'll come to that later. Um, but what we do have, uh, you find in EC Bananas and in Canada Autos, and there it basically was stated that service suppliers that supply like services are like service suppliers. Yeah, I think about that one. Um, and I'm not quite sure whether anybody would repeat that now, but that's what the case law says so far. And then finally, um, on treatment no less favorable, um, there again, um, what is relevant is EC Bananas 3. Um, again, we've got something. Um, if you compare Article um, 2, Most Favored Nation Obligation, with Article 17, national treatment obligation, you will see that in Article 17, there's explicit guidance given as to what it means treatment no less favorable. Huh? It's actually defined as uh, modifying the conditions of competition to the detriment of the foreign um, service or foreign service supply. That's what you have in 17. In Article 2, you have no such guidance as to how to interpret uh, the concept of treatment no less favorable. Yeah. You, you don't have any of that. Um, and the appellate body cautioned uh, against just using that guidance that you found, find in the context of Article 17 to use that guidance just in the context of Article uh, 2. So there's caution expressed. But I don't know whether that caution was really followed in any way because um, uh, two years later, in EC Bananas, Article 21.5, Ecuador, um, the panel in that case uh, just followed uh, the Article uh, 17 guidance when it was interpreted, uh, interpreting the concept of treatment no less favorable. Moving on um, to the national treatment obligation.
and again, I can say something about the relevance of aims and effects, and the short message is no relevance. I can say something about um, treatment no less favorable, and there, um, there's something very interesting. Um, it's a report that never came um, to the appellate body. Um, in China, electronic payment services, uh, the panel said that in order to establish whether there's treatment no less favorable, um, or to turn it around, to establish whether there is huh, treatment less favorable, um, you have to go through a two-step analysis. First of all, uh, you have to establish whether there is different treatment. And then, as a second step, you have to establish whether that different treatment is less favorable. And um, that's where the case law stands today. Uh, there has been academic commentary on this, um, but don't read from what I just said that I agree with that commentary or that I have a problem with this. I just refer you to some of the academic commentary. Um, unlikeness. Unlikeness. Um, I'll drop this because I saw Valerie look at her watch. Um, and I'll immediately go to the what I think is the more important uh, case, unlikeness. And it, it's the first real attempt, uh, not yet at the pellet body level, but at the level of a uh, panel, um, to um, define what likeness is in the context of uh, the GATS, and in particular in the context of Article 17. Um, the panel... Um, refers to the very extensive case law uh, that we have on likeness under Article 3 of the GATT. And then it says, well, you can't simply transpose this because there are huge differences between trading services and trading goods. Um, but then it's nevertheless, it's a, it's a great source of, inf of, of inspiration, um, that case law under the GATT. And comes to uh, basically the statement, and that's the final statement that it makes, that services are like when services are essentially or generally the same in competitive terms. So it's, it's, it's what you need in order to determine likeness of services and service suppliers is you need uh, to uh, look at um, evidence that pertains to the competitive relationship between the services and service suppliers. Uh, and, and for those who are familiar with how we determine likeness in the context of trading goods, this will sound very familiar and not surprising. All right, um, this brings us to market access obligations, uh, Article 16. Um, a first... Um, thing that we learned from the case law is that uh, panels said twice, but the appellate body hasn't said anything about it yet, panels have said twice thus far that the lists of measures that you find in Article 16, paragraph 2, that that list is, is exhaustive. So that it's these measures that are being covered by Article 16, no others. The appellate body has, um, in U.S. gambling, has said, well, we don't rule on this. Yeah. We don't take position. They didn't need to, so they... Um, next, in terms of uh, types of measures covered by Article um, 16, uh, let me make my comments very brief on this. Um, the problem was, um, in particular in U.S. gambling, that you had there a total prohibition total prohibition of um, cross-border supply. And the question was, is such a total prohibition, is that a, a market access barrier, a quantitative restriction of the kind that would fall under Article um, 16? And there could be some confusion about that because of the way in which these market access barriers were defined. They were defined as uh, in the form of a quantitative quota. Now, is a total ban on a service, is that huh, uh, a quantitative limitation? Well, the uh, appellate body uh, said, um, yes, it is. Huh? It's a zero quota. A zero quota is a market access barrier. Um, 
I could say something about uh, China electronic payment services, uh, but I will not tempt my luck. Um, <laughs> And um, something about market access and national treatment commitments, that's one of the things which, which has always confused me. Uh, it's always dangerous for a professor, I mean, you're not my students, but for a professor to admit to his students that he's confused about something. They love it to hear that, but you don't want to admit it too often. But this relationship between, um, between market access commitments and national treatment uh, commitments, and, and what happens if, if, if you have no commitment huh, in the market access column and you have a commitment um, in the national treatment commitment? And that was exactly the um, issue that came up in China Electronic Payment Services. And to keep a long discussion short, um, uh, the panel, because that case did not go to appeal, um, the panel um, said that there is no... Um, Article 16 does not substantively prevail over um, Article um, uh, 17. Huh? So the, 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 the market access commitments, or the lack thereof, huh, does not prevail over whatever you do uh, in terms of national treatment, not in a substantive way, but, and here's the trick, um, there is something that is called uh, schedule, scheduling primacy, yeah? um, and that you find in Article 20 um, of Article 20, Paragraph 2 of the GATS, um, which basically meant, well, to make it a bit more understandable, uh, that um, China um, maintained the right um, to have any sort of market access barrier because they had not made any market access commitment. <laughs> They had the right to maintain any sort of market access barrier, um, regardless their national treatment um, commitment. They had a strong and and and, and uh, 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 for mode one um, without limitation national um, uh, treatment commitment. You're very generous. Five minutes. Okay. <laughs> Um, still two slides to go, um, and one slide deals with the interpretation of schedules of commitments, or should I say the interpretation of the commitments um, that members have made in their uh, schedules. And the, the easy way of thinking about it is that, and that's what the appellate body also said in U.S. Gambling, um, schedules are an integral part of the GATS. And therefore, since they're an integral part of the GATS, uh, these schedules, 160 schedules, since they're an integral part, they need to be interpreted according to the same rules of interpretation than you would apply to the GATS, than you would apply to any WGO agreement. And we all know that these rules of interpretation have been codified huh, in Article 31 and 32 of the Vienna Convention, and that it basically means, and here's the, here's the catch, it basically means that an interpreter, a panel, and later the appellate body, has to uh, figure out, has to identify the common intention of the members. The common intention. So it's not only the intention of the member that has made the commitments, whose schedule it is. No, you have to go after the common intention of uh, the members. Um, there was an issue in U.S. gambling, um, and um, I think it surprised um, quite a few people how that eventually came out. Um, and then um, another issue came up uh, according to rules of interpretation in China, publications and audiovisual products, and that's basically um, that all the other provisions of the GATS form context uh, when you interpret um, the uh, commitments made in schedules. There's a very interesting question as to um, when you try to make sense of a term used in a schedule, whether the meaning needs to be given to that term should be the meaning that that term had or allegedly had at the time of the commitment 
or at the time that the panel looks at it and tries to make sense of it. And that's uh, an issue that came up um, in uh, China publications and audiovisual products. Um, and so basically it was, uh, do you interpret uh, the concepts of sound recordings and um, uh, distribution? Uh, do you look at that as these terms, what these terms meant uh, in 2001? when China joined and made its commitments, or do you look at it um, in 2009, 2010, when the panel and the appellate body tried to interpret um, these uh, terms? Um, perhaps we have some time to discuss this um, later. Um, this stares me in the face, um, so let me go on. Um, with regard to the relevance of W120 and the uh, scheduling guidelines, um, uh, the appellate body has ruled in U.S. gambling um, that um, they are not relevant as contexts, uh, but they may have relevance as supplementary means of interpretation. Um, with regard to the relevance of other members' schedules, um, it was said in U.S. gambling um, that other members' schedules may be relevant context. That's not surprising, because all schedules are an integral part of the GATS. So you can look at... Now, there's a warning there, though, um, that one must recognize um, that each, schedules, each schedule has its own logic. Huh? Um, and therefore, um, there's only so much that you can learn from looking at other members' schedules. Finally, uh, sectors and subsectors are mutually exclusive. That's what the appellate body said. Uh, in U.S. gambling, a specific sector has to go into one sector or subsector. It can't be in multiple uh, sectors. Finally, you'll be happy to hear, um, general exceptions, Article 14. Um, the appellate body in U.S. gambling said, and they borrowed that from they borrowed it shamelessly from the um, case law in Article 20 GATT, uh, that, it's a, that Article 14 provides for a two-tier analysis. Uh, you first have to determine whether the measure uh, is justified, provisionally justified, under one of the paragraphs of Article 14. And once you've done that, you have to see whether the application of the measure um, meets the requirements of the chapeau. Um, then... And this is where, it's one of the very few instances where the GATS jurisprudence has uh, a first. They've done something here that had not been done yet um, in the uh, GATT case law. In the GATT, for all these years, it's amazing, but there was never a case in which a panel, let alone the appellate body, uh, interpreted the concept of public morals under uh, the GATT Article 20A. The first time that the concept of public morals was interpreted was in the context of Article 14a GATS. Um, and I'm not going to read out uh, the definition that they gave, but the interesting you probably know this, but the interesting thing about this that, that, that the appellate body said that that concept of public morals can vary in time and space, can vary from member to member, and, and will vary depending on a range of factors, including the prevailing social, cultural, ethical, and religious values. So for those who didn't know this yet, there are no global public models. Uh, they may well be, did I now make a dangerous statement? I probably did. Um, Burden of, no, necessity tests. Necessity test is imported from uh, the GATS case law um, in, um, in um, U.S. gambling. Um, the uh, appellate body, well, first the panel and then the appellate body took over the test uh, that uh, had been defined for Article 20 in Korea beef. Uh, burden of proof, um, that's quite interesting, uh, but I'll leave that for questioning. And then finally... Finally, um, on the chapeau and on the question whether the measure as it is applied, a measure that is provisionally justified, and we're really talking uh, U.S. gambling, a measure that is provisionally justified 
under one of the paragraphs of Article um, 14. Whether that measure is applied in a, in a way that does not constitute arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination. Well, um, we've learned in that case, the panel said it and the appellate body did not contradict it, that the absence of consistency uh, in the measures taken to protect public, public models or maintain public order, the absence of consistency constitutes arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. And yes, I was a bit generous with you, um, but for those of you who have seen uh, Interstellar, I was on another planet somewhere and time didn't move quite the same way. But perhaps time has come back to Earth, but Professor Deli Matsis is going to talk to us for 20 minutes on standardization in services, new frontiers in rulemaking. Hear me? Yes. So I can make any, every joke I want uh, right now. Uh, uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Pierre Sauvé and Martin Juan for this invitation. This is a highly sophisticated, actually, environment for an academic. So I'm even more pleased to be uh, to be here. Um, I'll try to, to stick with uh, with time. The uh, the topic is about uh, standard setting in, in services. We know more or less everything about standard setting in goods, but not so much about standard setting in services. When I first received the invitation, and this is partly the reason why I accepted it, was uh, a statement by the editor suggesting that uh, we should think uh, outside the box or something along these lines. So come up with something creative. So services uh, expertise, I think, is a uh, you know there is a scarce resource. There are not so many uh, around. I was happy already to be in this uh, in this group. I was honoured, uh, and I thought this is a, a great occasion to do something that I always wanted, which is actually to work on uh, standard setting in the realm of uh, of services. Uh, on the side of the European Union, this is a very timely topic, uh, simply because in the uh, Single Market Act, which is, if you like, for those who do not know European law, your EU law, an attempt on the side of the uh, former, now, European Commission to revamp internal market, and particularly internal market for, uh, for services. Um, so I thought it was a great uh, opportunity, actually, to uh, talk about um, about this. Now there is some animation in my, uh, in, my, in, my uh, in my slides, but here apparently it doesn't show. So you're obliged to see the entire slide at once. Uh, so we know uh, all the basic assumptions about uh, standard setting, why standard setting is, is good. Standard setting is good because we uh, manage to lower transaction costs, because we address information asymmetries, because we address interoperability and interchangeability. And this means actually that uh, uh, we manage to have more trade, right? Uh, the uh, standards play a very essential uh, trade facilitating um, uh, role. This is the orthodox, uh, the orthodox assumption that we have also in the, um, in the TBT uh, agreement. So similar um, um, uh, thoughts, uh, similar uh, assumptions also apply in the, uh, in the area of, uh, of services. And this is one of the, uh, this is the first point that I want to make. The second point is that there is a uh, interrelationship between uh, tradability of uh, services, so the increased ability of services to be traded, and uh, the uh, ability to standardize uh, uh, services. So the fact that we have this commoditization of services, and this goes probably to Ricardo's comment about stretching the vocabulary, um, um, allows us to also uh, standardize uh, service or, or at least open the discussion about standardizing um, uh, services. Now, to date, there are plenty of technical uh, standards to, to services. So think payment services, financial services in, 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 in general, postal services, health services, so uh, health-related. Uh, services. So there is uh, already a, a certain body of, uh, of uh, standards in um, areas relating to, uh, to services. 
But what is coming now up is the, uh, the discussion of setting standards on uh, quality. Of, uh, of services. And this is something that uh, is, uh, has been a taboo for a long uh, period, but right now, at least in the European Union, it's becoming a, um, uh, a very important issue and has already been discussed since um, uh, about 2005. A uh, fourth point that I want to, uh, uh, to make is that uh, hard law in, uh, in the European Union context, at least, which is one of the most integrated uh, regulatory areas, I think you agree with me, uh, hard law hasn't really worked very well in uh, services in uh, the EU, right? Although there have been many advances in uh, other areas, in services we didn't manage to complete the single market uh, yet. And once we realized this in, uh, in the early uh, 2000, we also thought uh, within the European Union that we should go towards softer forms of uh, law, including uh, codes of conduct and also including uh, voluntary uh, standards. So there, there is this uh, uh, hope, at least, that uh, soft law can be much more promising in delivering um, in the uh, area of services regulation than uh, hard law. Uh, the fifth point that I want to uh, um, uh, make is that uh, uh, quality uh, standards, so quality services standards, if you like, uh, so standards that ensure the quality of a service, um, is an area that is very, very uh, uh, sensitive, right? Because we try to find common denominators. And this, this can be quite a trivial, uh, a quite a, uh, a daunting task, I'm sorry. Um, this is all the more so because typically uh, technical standards are, have no normative content, while quality standards do have this normative content. They do say something about preferences of particular uh, people, and this makes it very hard to, uh, uh, to find uh, common uh, denominators. But within the European Union, this is why, what we try to do right now, maybe giving the example for other um, uh, regions in the world. And the last point that I want to, uh, to make is that inclusive processes of standards development are important. This is something that has been discussed uh, quite extensively in, uh, in the area of, of uh, not extensively, but there is a, a, a certain a relatively good point of literature, good uh, body of liter literature on uh, uh, inclusiveness and due process, if you like, in standard setting in goods. Uh, similar. Uh, considerations should also apply in the area of uh, services. Now, why uh, standardize uh, services and why it is possible now to standardize services? It is possible because uh, certain characteristics uh, that were used as an excuse not to standardize services, like uh, the tailor-made um, services, the invisibility uh, or the need for proximity, are gradually um, eroding. Economy has also uh, uh, advanced, and this makes uh, st service standardization much uh, easier. Secondly, there is a focus on uh, downstream markets. So we move away uh, from upstream markets to, to focus more on downstream markets, and this means that we, we focus more on the consumption of services and thus on consumer uh, pro protection considerations. So uh, some essential requirements at that point are quite uh, important to protect already the, uh, the consumers. What we also have realized, at least in the European Union, and I think this is a, a global phenomenon, is that quality is used as a, an excuse in order to raise barriers uh, against trade in, um, um, in uh, services. And the, uh, as I was saying earlier, the, the main uh, beneficial effects of standardization also apply in goods, also apply in services, I'm sorry. So this is why we opened this um, uh, discussion. When we talk about uh, standardization, I think we should be reminded that we talk, uh, or, or about standards in services, we talk about voluntary rules which are consensus-driven, uh, so they are supported by a large amount of, uh, of experts. 
And the, the idea is to, to, to set certain requirements which would allow services to fit for, um, uh, uh, for purpose. However, the use of technical standards may be mandatory, and this is something that we saw in the uh, China electronic payment uh, services. I will not enter into this uh, more. We can develop this in the, um, in, um, in the, um, in the questions. Now, the focus on quality services seems to be new, but it's not really new. So, uh, serv the quality or qualitative standards uh, on, uh, on services is something that we've uh, seen around the world, maybe not, not in a uh, consistent way. But already the ISO 9001 uh, has also been adapted by services, by the services industry. So it's not only manufacturing. Manufacturing is about 70%. Uh, manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing sector has adapted um, ISO 9001, but services industries are also part of, um, of this uh, game. So it's not really new. When we examine the, uh, the relevant uh, legislation and the relevant players uh, in um, standard setting in, in services, uh, we should be obviously analyzing uh, the international dimension, so World Trade Organization and the GATS, the European legislation, and then there is also national legislation. So on the side of the European Union, this uh, uh, relationship is something that um, has been uh, um, taken, taken up. Now, service standards in the EU. So why I discuss standardization in, uh, standardization in services within the EU and not globally? First, because I didn't have lots of time to finish the paper. So the international dimension comes later. But more importantly, because the uh, standardization in services um, in the EU is uh, very important not only because of the political economy of standard setting services but also because the uh, European Union plays a very important role, a leading role or a dominant role some would argue in the international standard setting bodies, notably uh, the ISO and uh, others. A second uh, or third reason if you like is that uh, the, um, uh, the EU has been quite uh, serious with centralizing the standard setting system within the European uh, uh, Union and the new approach as we call it uh, within the European Union has been quite a success right so right now the idea is that we uh, expand the, the, the new approach towards uh, uh, services within the European Union and this is uh, uh, looked at with a great uh, interest not only the European Union but also outside uh, the European Union, notably because of the uh, current negotiations on the um, TTIP. I'll move a bit quicker. Instruments to be used in a new strategy for uh, um, uh, services. The first, the very, the, the most important instrument I think here is to establish a, a European definition for quality, for the quality of the service. This is, a, I think, in my view at least, the, uh, uh, the starting point. And then establish a sort of infrastructure which would allow us to, to, uh, to complete this soft approach to standard setting in, uh, in services. This includes a multi-stakeholder approach, but also includes a set of, of different rules relating to certification, codes of contact, labels, etc., etc., including voluntary standards. And the idea is there going back to, uh, uh, to what we had about uh, goods in the European Union, that if you comply with all this, then there is a presumption of conformity with EU legislation and a fortiori national uh, legislation. So there is a stick and a carrot there. <laughs> what to standardize? Very quickly, to close my uh, presentation. Um, there are certain elements that we can uh, obviously standardize and we have rules, both hard and soft law uh, nature, uh, that uh, regulate services um, uh, right now, not only nowadays, not only in the European Union, but also uh, uh, globally. So there are five, five uh, uh, groups of um, uh, rules that we can, uh, that we can standardize.
The first the relates to design, so everything that has to do with the risk assessment, planning, and um, several other um, issues. The second uh, area that we, standard, we can standardize, and this is something that the uh, services directive of 2006 already uh, alluded to, is information to consumers. So let's say you have been service suppliers, and then there is a particular information that they should uh, uh, disclose vis-a-vis -vis the consumers up front. Right? And this is something that, that we can indeed uh, uh, standardize. Another issue is characteristics of the service uh, supplier. This may relate to human resources, subcontracting, after sales issues, but can also relate arguably uh, to the uh, competences of particular service providers. So think of competences of professional service um, suppliers. Another issue is terms of service contracts, and this is quite uh, sensitive because simply we are in, within the European Union um, uh, completing the uh, European private law through the back door. And this is something that private lawyers, private law scholars do not like. And the final element that we can standardize is complaints and uh, remedies when we have a, uh, a problematic supply of a service. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I think I did pretty well in terms of time. Thank you, Professor. Very, very well indeed. An A plus for you. No wonder you were moving up that CV so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, uh, colleague Peter Morrison is going to talk to us about why the GATT needs its own TBT agreement and will be um, speaking uh, in connection with the papers provided by Petros Mavoridis and Bernard Hochman. Thank you very much and I'd also like to thank the organizers for having invited me to present this paper um, written by very distinguished former colleagues of, this of the Secretariat to Bernard Hochman and Petros Mavoridis. Um, when I first got a copy of the paper just a few days ago, I was intrigued by the title, uh, which is A Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement for Services, question um, mark, uh, because as someone who'd spent quite a bit of time doing um, involved in the services negotiations, I thought we were talking a lot about uh, uh, technical barriers uh, in services sorts of issues. Um, how assured a little bit because I was once told that if you see a uh, headline in a paper or a, a magazine that ends in a question mark, uh, then you should always assume the answer is no. Um, and it's actually quite true. But then I went to the subtitle of this paper and it was equally intriguing, no need to rock the casbah. And that sent me to Wikipedia to see where that came from, because it certainly hadn't been mentioned by the negotiators in the uh, <laughs> meetings I'd attended. I found out, for those of you who might similarly be baffled, that it comes from a 1982 pop song by the group The Clash. So um, I was trying to make the link yesterday evening between the and that song, but uh, I gave up in the end. Case, um, I'm delighted to, to do a brief um, commentary on this paper, which is, is very stimulating and raises the question for somebody who has been in the services negotiations, perhaps there's something we've left out here, perhaps there is a need for a TBT uh, for services. Um, in the time I have, I've, I'll uh, be brief. I will look at first the key points made by the, um, by the authors. Um, I'll go over their conclusions and then, if the chair permits, a very brief further thoughts uh, uh, what, what I, I think of the paper um, as it is. So um, the authors start by looking at the TBT agreement, observing that there was long ago recognized a need for disciplines on standards um, and technical regulations and the authors note the various disciplines contained in the agreement. Now, it's important here to, to realize the scope of this agreement, to understand the scope of the TBT. Um, it refers to documents that relate to or describe product characteristics and related processes. 
So we're talking about quite a, a, um, a narrow range of measures, and these are mandatory um, if they are technical regulations, and according to the jargon, if they're standards, then they're voluntary. So relating to product characteristics and related um, processes. Now, the TBT, when it started life as a um, code, of course, was a standalone agreement, so it's not surprising that they have um, an MFN and a national treatment principle, even though you might think that that would be covered by the GATT. Um, and that issue, I think, has come up um, in recent case law. But the core of the TBT, as the authors point out, is the so-called least restrictive uh, least trade restrictive principle, which uh, requires that these uh, uh, regulations uh, be um, no, uh, not create unnecessary obstacles to international trade and be no more trade restrictive than necessary to fulfill a legitimate objectives. And the legitimate objectives are very similar to someone who's familiar with Article 20. Uh, they relate to um, human animal life, uh, human animal plant life, life and health, um, and prevention of deceptive practices, national security, and so on. And there's also a requirement that the uh, need to uh, have such a regulation be assessed and the risks be um, uh, assessed as well. And finally, there is coverage of con conformity assessment procedures. It's one thing to establish a technical regulation. It's another thing to also to check whether it has been uh, um, met by an imported product. And there are equally disciplines in the TB TBT, uh, non-discrimination, ones you would expect, that cover those um, conformity assessment procedures. And right away as I go through that list, I'm thinking in the GATS that do we already have that in the GATS or uh, is there something uh, missing? Uh, the authors then go on to uh, look at standards and services. And I'm glad I'm following uh, uh, Panagiotis here because he uh, outlined very clearly the status of standards, technical regulations and services and how they may be few in number, uh, they are growing in importance. And the authors in this paper uh, take note of wonder why that is the case, why there are far fewer uh, um, technical uh, regulations in services, and perhaps this is due to the intangible nature largely. Uh, technical regulations are involved in measuring weighing, assessing, there's a metrology that is talked about, and of course that's difficult to do if you're dealing with an intangible thing such as a service. You're having to measure or assess the results of the service or perhaps the input, or as frequently re uh, happens, you're talking about the qualifications of the supplier of the service, the lawyer, the engineer typically, who would be supplying the service, for example. Um, the authors also note that internationally standards are often fragmented between particular services sectors. So you have a group of organizations which deal with financial services regulations. You'll have maritime regulations dealt with by the IMO, ITU dealing with telecommunications regulations. And also probably because you're dealing a lot with the qualifications of suppliers, these regulations tend to be uh, uh, established by subnational bodies, uh, not the central government. So that probably makes international standardization a little more difficult. Uh, the authors then turn to and uh, examine whether the GATS uh, contains provisions which could be similar or adequate indeed in order to discipline uh, standards and services. And they recognize uh, in the end that in fact it does contain uh, quite a few of the what would be considered necessary uh, disciplines. But first of all, there's the question of the scope of the GATS. I mentioned the scope of the TBT agreement. In the GATS, there's a specific scope provision which is stated to be measures by members affecting trade and services. 
Now, to the extent that a technical regulation would be a measure taken by a member, then automatically it's in within the scope of all the provisions of the WTO, all the, all the non-discrimination provisions, market access provisions, uh, transparency provisions, all the, the other main uh, obligations. So right away we do have some reassurance here that we have coverage. So MFN, Article 2, National Treatment, Transparency, uh, and um, but apart from these major disciplines, the core of the regulation of standards is considered to be uh, the demand provision in Article 6, 4, which provides for the no more burdens uh, provision, which has been subject to a lot of debate. However, um, as you know, this is established as a principle uh, which is subject to negotiation, further negotiations, um, uh, as is, is the uh, requirement that any uh, domestic regulations be uh, be based on objective and transparent criteria. I should mention that 6.4 is limited to a certain subset of measures, and these are measures um, which are licensing requirements and procedures, qualification requirements and procedures, and technical, um, uh, technical re, uh, requirements, standards. Um, so these are principles set out and to be negotiated, and this is being carried out, of course, by the Working Party in Domestic Regulation, which has been at work for quite a while now in order to establish any um, necessary uh, disciplines. Um, there are also, the authors point out, recognition procedures in the GATT in Article 7, which allows a WTO member to uh, recognize and accept the uh, qualification requirements of another member. Um, either autonomously or on a reciprocal basis. Um, but it in the paper that it, there is no requirement, as exists in the TBT agreement, to base regulations on relative, relevant international standards. And this is a sort of pro-harmonization uh, pro provision that's found in the TBT, encourages members, if they're thinking of regulating uh, with respect to a standard, to uh, to come as close as possible to that, um, to the international standard. Um, now, I just add a little aside here. There is a mention of international standards um, in Article 6, which, 65B in fact, which uh, deals with the interim situation before disciplines have been agreed upon, which is in the situation where it is. And it says there that uh, count shall be taken to de when determining whether a member is in conformity with the interim situation. Count shall be taken of international standards of relevant international organizations applied by that member. Now that's not a full uh, um, obligation, fully operative ob obligation as you'd find in the TBT, but it is going in that direction. Um, the authors also note that under the GATS, of course, there's no across-the-board national treatment. Uh, that, I would say, though, is due to an entirely different architecture. Um, there's, of course, no, uh, cr there are no uh, practical uh, use of border measures. Therefore, the discrimination you find under the GATT in trade in goods and products, tariffs, uh, doesn't, by and large, exist in the GATT, so you do need some flexibility on the national treatment side. Um, the conclusions of the paper um, are perhaps not surprising. The authors say there's no need uh, for a TBT agreement for the GATS uh, for various reasons. And the first they give is that the GATS has largely addressed the matter. And the negotiators um, went as far as they could go, uh, quote from the paper. Um, and that's perhaps true at the time, in the early 90s, there really was no uh, uh, possibility of going further. And the fact that a work program was set up, which eventually turned into the Working Party for Domestic Regulation, is testimony to that, that they simply ran out of time. The authors also note that there are relatively few international uh, services standards. 
and that these are already dealt with and perhaps there's no great need for uh, a separate TBT style agreement in services. Uh, they also raised the intriguing possibility or the thought that members may be loath to uh, make too many new obligations in this area because of the DSU implications that um, with regard, for example, to the necessity or the no less trade restrictive principle or the necessity principle, um, how would this operate if a dispute were to go to the panel and then the appellate body? So there may be a possible cooperation freeze, as the authors note, with respect to new obligations. Um, the so-called missing requirement to refer to international standards, they say, would probably be too difficult to achieve at this point, um, though, uh, and in addition, the accountancy disciplines, uh, which have been, in fact, agreed by the uh, Council for Trade and Services, and um, which provides specific disciplines in the area of accountancy services, uh, for the authors show how difficult it is not, uh, to, to achieve because they have not yet entered into uh, effect. Uh, in fact, they are to enter into effect at the close of the current negotiating round, uh, which is uh, the formal reason why they would not be um, uh, in force. Um, in adding my own uh, thoughts to the paper, I think it's a, it, overall, I think it's an extremely interesting um, examination of the need uh, for these important obligations in the services area. Um, and uh, I, I hesitate since I see some of my services negotiated, so I do not want to preempt which direction they may want to go, and they may well decide they would like a TBT for services. But I think one could say, um, at a minimum, uh, that one should take into account uh, what is contained in this paper, and in fact, what reflects uh, what reflects what is already in the agreement that the GATS does contain a lot of core. Uh, much of the core of the TBT agreement, um, and in particular the uh, least trade restrictive principle, reasonable regulation, transparency, recognition. But as well, we have the Working Party in Domestic Regulation, which has been tasked to continue work on evolving disciplines based on the principles set out in Article uh, 6.4. So we have progress. Uh, it's true that the accountancy disciplines have not been put into effect uh, yet. They're due to uh, come into force at the close of the round. But perhaps this is not, should not be put down as a complete failure um, with respect to a sectoral approach. Um, as for the horizontal approach, that is of a chairman's text but is, of course, linked by the overall state of the DDA, so it is not advanced for uh, some time. Um, I think that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for keeping to the time and for the interesting remarks. And now we turn to our discussant, Fabien Guel, of the European Commission, please. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me uh, uh, today for this um, discussion. So I guess it is my, my role to um, bring possibly a, a different perspective on the topic discussed today. And actually what I would like to do is to build on the last two uh, presentations on standards and this question of, of, of TBT for services and maybe share some uh, remarks on what has been our experience with, with standards in free trade agreement at the WTO and, and where we are uh, in our, I would say, daily trade negotiations uh, on that. And when, when I listen to the last two presentations, you, you cannot help but notice the importance of standard regulations, and you wonder why we do not devote more time uh, to those issues in, in trade negotiations. But actually, if you look in, speak for the, for the European Union, if you look into our FTAs, you will see that so far there's a little space that is devoted to, to standards uh, yet. So we could say that that topic is still underdeveloped in our trade policy so far, but certainly um, this is an issue we, we would like to look at more, and we're certainly thankful for the research that is being currently done uh, here and there. And trying to think about why we could say that standard in trade agreements are 
I think some elements have already been put forward uh, today. If you look at the EU standards, uh, I think the figures is something between 2 and 3 percent of EU standards are about services. So if you think that in a trade in services negotiation, most of the time the move is start with the domestic reforms and then is consolidated into a trade agreement. If you look at standards are also underdeveloped they are at, at EU level, that also explains why we haven't come to extensive discipline on standard uh, EU. And another reason is obviously, I mean, we just mentioned the work of the Working Party on domestic regulation, uh, which has been ongoing for quite there are still many outstanding questions on, on standard there. Uh, what do we do with the voluntary standard? Um, what do we do with the mandatory? How do we define them? Do we talk about the standards, about the measures of standard? Um, and once we have identified what we talk about, what is the type of discipline we want to put on those elements? Because most of the DR disciplines nowadays talk about licensing requirement and procedures, but would that be appropriate on standards, which are sometimes a different animal? So there's still lots of questions um, outstanding. And if we look back in our FTA negotiation, it's true that most of our partners have not definitive views on, on what we should do with, uh, with that. Um, so, looking at free trade agreement done by the, the European Union, have we delivered something on, on standards so far? Uh, the response would be partially. If we look at what I would say, the, the older FTA we've had uh, so far, uh, we always have obviously a chapter on trading services that contains some discipline regulation, transparency, and some sectoral disciplines. But for a very long time, most of the time, we would replicate GATS Article 6, no more. So we would not venture for a long time into detailed discipline on any elements of, of GATS Article 6. Um, so if you look at standards, they were covered as much as GATS Article 6 would cover uh, standards. Obviously, that was the past. We, at some point, had a brand new approach to uh, domestic regulation in our, in our free trade agreement, uh, basically due uh, to the work done at the WTO and the WPDR, but also to our own internal reform. And the, the services directive was mentioned earlier today, the reform we've introduced in the European Union to consolidate the internal market. And that has given us the tools to uh, launch in our FTAs comprehensive disciplines on uh, domestic regulation and everything that goes uh, with that. So now if you open a more recent FTA, uh, looking at the one with, uh, for example, Singapore, Moldova, Georgia, which are the, the more recent uh, FTA, you will find some more comprehensive disciplines on, on that. You will find, for example, on licensing requirements and procedures, uh, qualification requirements and procedures, we spell out, for example, obligations um, such as the different criteria on which a measure uh, that define licensing requirements or licensing procedures should be based. Objectivity, transparency, proportionality. So we bring some of the elements to frame uh, measures uh, relating to licensing, authorization, qualification uh, requirements. And that was quite uh, an interesting uh, development. In that new model, uh, again, it's interesting to see that standards are not identified as such. Um, so we could not pull out of a EU FTA uh, specific discipline on standards. Now, if you look at uh, compulsory standards that are part of the element the service supplier should comply with to be authorized, then it is covered. If it's part of the licensing requirements world, then obviously we are being covering standards for a very long time. But there is no uh, dedicated uh, provision for that as such. What is interesting that we have seen beyond the general discipline, an increase in the uh, reference to standards in the sectoral parts of our trade agreement. If you look in financial services, for example, we've introduced uh, best endeavor clause for encouraging the parties to adhere to some international standards that are set out by uh, the Basel Committee, by the G20. So we bring some international references into our, our trade agreements on a best endeavor basis. Uh, so this is, this is the beginning, but this is an example where we bring at a sectoral level some uh, of the standards. And maybe among all the, the FTA, so we have lots of ongoing negotiation, but the there's one that was mentioned earlier today, which is the, the EU-US uh, negotiation, the TTIP, 
which is uh, very much different from what we have been doing so far. And uh, the regulation aspect, the standard aspect, uh, will possibly be uh, more, more important. Um, there's lots of studies that have been done before we start the, the negotiation. And, and there is one number which is, I think, telling. Uh, according to some evaluation, 80% of the gains of that agreement will come from addressing issues relating to regulations and, and trading services and public procurement. So that, that issue is 80% of what we could gain from such a broad agreement. Um, obviously, the negotiation is, is ongoing and there are many ideas that, that, that are floated, but um, if we look at what has been uh, discussed so far and what are the different ideas uh, that have been uh, propose, of course, the, the issue of mutual recognition is, is very important. Uh, uh, we expect uh, certainly a strong focus on, on professional services, and, and many ideas have been expressed in, in this regard. We will certainly go further. In most of our FTA, we have a, a framework for future mutual recognition agreement. TTIP could be uh, possibly the place where we already uh, recognize a certain qualification. Um, if you look in financial services, there's also some thinking there um, to, uh, to bring together uh, uh, regulators to make sure international standards are implemented uh, in a consistent manner. Uh, the very specific case of financial services, I mean, has the objective to uh, uh, strengthen the, the, the prudential regulations, obviously, to avoid uh, a future uh, crisis, and that's through that lens that being uh, discussed. And I think in the TTIP talks, there are many examples. In telecommunication, for example, we're looking at ensuring that uh, regulation will be technologically neutral, so addressing the standard from, from the other end, preventing that standard and being used to be, to be a buyer when it's not uh, necessary. Obviously, this, this broad debate uh, of, of standard and regulation in TTIP is, is not there to deregulate in the sense of affecting consumer protection and health, but just ensuring that um, we are addressing those, those bias uh, too. And what is interesting in this, this process, which is very much different from previous FTA negotiation, is that regulators are also part of the discussion, uh, and that is, uh, which is uh, new. And just to finish on our trade agreement experience, this obviously the team which is uh, ongoing, uh, and we will certainly have conversation on, on, on standards as part of the domestic regulation negotiation. And personally, I think that one will be interesting because we have um, in the group of participants uh, to the TISA negotiation uh, the, the broad spectrum of position on domestic regulation and standards. So whatever outcome could come out of that negotiation could be an interesting example of what can be done uh, at, uh, at the global level. So that was on my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabien. So now we uh, come to uh, the opportunity for you to put questions to all of our experts here. We've had a very uh, broad-ranging discussion, and I think what I propose to do, uh, I'll take uh, two or three questions in a row, if you, and then uh, if you might say who you are, to whom you're directing the question, then we'll give our experts a chance to answer, and then we can take some more questions after we finish the first group of them. And uh, either Pierre is correcting me on the approach, or he has a question. Madam Chair, I would never dare to correct you after my very politically incorrect introduction. Um, just a question to Petros Mavroidis. <laughs> I'm going to take advantage of the fact that he's not in the room to take exception with his views. Um, I don't understand the argument, but Pe Pe Peter perhaps um, can venture an answer or any of the panelists. Why would we uh, not be so concerned with the regulatory chill dimension of TBT and SPS that target very sensitive issues of food security and technical standards, and yet in services we consider the scope for uh, freeze or whatever you want to call it as something that really makes it extremely difficult to contemplate a TBT type agreement in a services context. I'm struck at how uh, we, we have super great deference to regulators in, service, in services industries. We defer to their superior knowledge and power and wisdom and uh, we don't or we haven't and we continue not to 
from a trade perspective, in goods trade. How, how, do, how do we explain that? Thanks, Pierre. And we'll give Peter a chance to send an email to Petros. To, um, second question, please. Thank you very much, Sherry Stevenson. I appreciate you. Um, all the presentations, very interesting, very well done. I, I'd like to take up something that Pana Jotis mentioned, which I think is a really interesting um, new trend or fairly recent trend is the, that towards moving towards uh, quality standards in the area of services. And these quality standards, one would think in practice, would be a little bit you know, less harmful than technical standards or technical regulations because they are, they are not um, obligatory. So they're voluntary and so forth. But I think that they could be, in another way, just as difficult uh, to deal with and might have just as a kind of a potentially negative impact on trade in the sense of this normative content uh, involved. And we know that in services, there is such a variety of services. Um, and there's a large vari variation in consumer preferences around services quality. So potentially, there would be a large variation around quality standards as well, even though they're voluntary. But we all know that when you require labeling on different standards, you know, it, it makes it harder sometimes for suppliers to meet those different um, levels and in order to service foreign markets. And so my question would be really, do you think, given that you've done the research on this paper, that um, there is the danger that these quality, the move towards quality standards could bring us to a lot of variation in the world economy that would have a fairly negative impact on, on services trade, one of the biggest, you know, potential out there for developing countries is to participate in the services economy and offshoring. Would this really provide a damper and a potential for, you know, for cutting off perhaps some of that ability because of the voluntary but nonetheless, you know, need to meet these quality uh, standards? Thanks. Okay, so the last question from this particular session. Yes, please. Just a quiz, uh, quick question addressed to Professor Peter. Um, Your name, please. Uh, Josie from China University of International Business and Economics Law School. So a quick question for uh, Professor Van den Bosch. Uh, according to your observation, why do we have such few gas cases? Uh, a related question could be uh, whether this trend will change in the future along with the increasing importance of services income. Thank you. So thank you. So now the first question from Pierre Sauvé to Peter Morrison, please. Well, I'll do my best to answer on uh, Petrus's uh, behalf, but maybe also on my own a little bit here. Um, I think, uh, and the question as I understood it was, um, why the deference to the services area, why the skittishness about being brought under dispute settlement rules and so on. Um, I think one general answer you could say is the timing is different, that we're not uh, 20 years ago. And um, I think that any discussion, bringing any new obligations within the multilateral system is, um, is, is difficult, to be honest. Uh, perhaps because we've had experience in dispute settlement with necessity tests, uh, we've gone through um, uh, the examination of necessity test as defense. Um, we're, we've now had experience with um, the necessity type principle as an, a positive obligation in the TBT uh, area. And I think that some members at least are quite cautious in their approach towards this, to say the least, and would want to know where this might lead. But this is linked to another factor which is particular, I think, to trade and services. Um, first point perhaps that because of the intangibility, the, the more perhaps complicated nature of services trade, um, uh, trade policy people don't feel they have a grasp uh, as to what these disciplines might meet in, mean in particular circumstances. Um, but secondly, the range of services sectors covers the uh, 
perhaps mundane to uh, sectors which are highly sensitive in certain countries. Um, you're talking about audiovisual services, you're talking about maritime, you're talking about, there are many services that in particular members um, have a certain sensitivity about them, which perhaps you might not find as much in goods trade or goods disciplines, not to say there aren't those sensitivities. Uh, and recall also that if you're talking about TBT or um, especially at SPS, you're talking about quite a focused concern related to human health and, and, and safety, um, which makes it perhaps easier to accept those disciplines. Um, that, that would be my answer there, no doubt. Uh, no doubt Petrus would want to add a few and maybe subtract one, um, but that's, that's the best I can do. Thank you. Panagiotis, the question from Sherry Stevenson. Yes. Um, thank you very much for your uh, question. Um, I think I, uh, you know, I should pay tribute to your work as well. I remember when I was writing my PhD in a given moment you were writing about NAFTA and professional qualifications and regulatory equivalents. This is something that um, does relate to, to quality of a service and I think it was quite uh, uh, you know, very important uh, work also to show what works and what doesn't, right? So the next best thing, if you like, is creating quality standards rather than start discussing about regulatory equivalence. Um, I, I fully agree about the, uh, the variation. Uh, this is why in the paper, in a given moment, I, uh, I asked the question whether it would make sense to bring all this, all this discussion at the, at the ISO level, notably because uh, this is a discussion that has been led by the European um, standard setting bodies like AFNOR or the, uh, the British standard setting body or even the German uh, standard setting body, DIN. Uh, so there is a lot of, of expertise uh, there and there seems to be a sort of duplication or overlap, if you like, so why not bring this at the, um, uh, the ISO level? Uh, notably because we, we do realize that um, there is national expertise and this is exported uh, uh, at, the international, uh, at the international level. I'll stop here. I think. Thank you. And, and Peter, why so few cases on the gas? I wish I knew. I, I'd um, like to say. Oh, sorry. This. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead, please. No, please, please. <laughs> Let me try no, one let thing. <laughs> let, let me try one thing, and then, I, then you can contradict me. Um, <laughs> the only thing I can think of um, is um, well, what, what sort of disputes would you have? I mean, if you look at the GATT, uh, what, what are most of the disputes are national treatment and their market access. Uh, but not that many under the GATT. You don't have that many uh, most favoured nation uh, disputes. Some, but not that many. Um, so if you then look at the GATS, um, we may not have many disputes uh, so far because of the extent of trade liberalization that was realized in the Uruguay round. Uh, that extent was, well, was not very, very deep going. Um, so that's perhaps um, a reason why uh, and some of the other obligations um, in the GATS um, are clearly um, underdeveloped uh, and, and would need further development. Uh, but I'm sure that Peter... Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll have to do with that. Let's, let me take uh, a couple more questions. Two more questions. I didn't get to this side of the room. Yes, please. Hi, my, my name is Hannes Schlimmer, and I'm with WTF. I was also going to take issue with this notion that the GATS does not need it, or the WTO does not need a TBT agreement. I think we need it really badly. In fact, we need a TBT and a trade facilitation agreement in services. Uh, those are obviously sisters, and they tackle the same thing. Um, but taking up a point that Fabien mentioned, obviously we have had services standards all along. We have them in qualifications, we have them in licensing, and in fact we have them in, uh, in an area when, when they start touching discrimination, non-discrimination issues, when they are designed in a way that they would become national treatment issues, we could 
imagine that to happen. I mean, gambling could have been a standards case instead of a ban case, um, and then we would have had to deal with that. So in that sense, I think we, I, I think we obviously need it. I think the conclusion that we may not be able to get it right now may be true, but I think that certain shouldn't detract from the fact that we need it. That said, the domestic regulation disciplines are precisely that. That's the TBT agreement and services plus and minus a little bit here and there. Um, and maybe the last remark goes back to what I said first, is that uh, obviously in, in the GATS, the GATS very consciously covers service providers and services at the same time, um, because very often you cannot really distinguish the two uh, when it comes to actually looking at what's happening in real life. Um, and that means when we talk about standards, we also have to look at both of them at the same time. But if we want to single out services as opposed to service providers, then we actually, and we really want to um, look at the parallels to goods, we would actually have to look at what, the, the, what happens when the service is supplied. And that's where Panos was going, but I think we need to go even further. If you really want to draw the parallel, then the standards that, for example, a lawyer has to work with when he or she gives a piece of legal advice are the entirety of what is correct and not correct in his law. Now, that makes it really, really broad, I realize that, but I think that's, that's, that's really, that's really the, the, the frontiers that we need, to, we, we need to think in or within. Thanks. And was that to Petros and Peter Morrison? That was a question to everyone. You have to delimit it, because otherwise we'll never finish. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Rosie Zhang from the uh, Trading Service Division, WTO Secretariat. Um, the question is addressed to Professor Vanderbosch. I, I noticed just now, um, uh, it, it seemed to me that you wanted to say something about the interpretation of the schedules of specific commitments. And apparently, because um, you, are in, you were in, intimidated by Valerie, and you had no time to uh, elaborate, so I, I think it's better to give you a chance to elaborate. Um, yeah, well, you know, as a, as a staff from Secretariat, um, observing, you know, sort of negotiation or rulemaking on services on a daily basis, um, and, or working on trading services, you know, um, sometimes we feel very frustrated uh, by the fact that there's very little guidance from, AB, from everybody on, on the GATS. Okay. But sometimes, you know, um, the A-B uh, interpretation can also make, you know, our life um, a little bit difficult. Um, so, okay, Rosie, uh, wrap it up now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, in, in terms of interpretation, uh, you, you, according to the jurisprudence in the uh, China audiovisual case that, you know, the uh, schedule of specific commitments should be interpreted, uh, you know, according to the meaning, uh, not at the time of commitments, but at the time of, you know, the dispute. And, and then, so we observe that, you know, uh, some trade negotiators, they, they, they have, you know, reservation on that, and then there's a sort of uh, chilling effect on that. And then because schedules, they are subject to, you know, further negotiation, you know, the agreement. And, and then so, you know, um, and if, if, you know, members, they, well, they are presumed that they can, they have undertaken commitments uh, on services they couldn't even uh, foresee at, at the time of negotiation. And then so then, then what's the point to have, you know, success, successive round of negotiation? So then it's... Okay, Rosie, I'm going to stop you there. Yes. And at the coffee break, you can finish your question. Well, I'm done because yet. I just uh, want to ask Professor to probably... I'm very intimidating, as you've said. I'm already very intimidating. So what I've... The guy who's more intimidating, who's bigger than I am, said that I'm not allowed to get anyone answering any questions. You'll have to do it at the coffee break because we're way too late. Pierre says we have to stop now. So I'm sure that uh, Peter will be glad to answer your questions. We'll get your question answered during the coffee break. Thank you so much. Can you thank our speakers with me?